in the wilderness. Prepare the way for the Lord. Are you happy to be in church? Yeah, you might as well be happy. Keep coming, give, give praise to Jesus. We thank you, Lord. You're worthy. Jesus. Yes, Lord. Okay, you can have your seat. Go on, sit down. Yes, I'm out of the doghouse nine years and I made it back <laughs> to be with you this morning. How great's Mark Saundercock, by the way? Don't we love Saundy? Have you ever seen Mark Saundercock? Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly what I'm about to say. Have you ever seen Saundy and I have a conversation? It's just two guys yelling at each other, not listening and laughing at their own joke. <laughs> and I'm grateful for it. So good on you, Saundy. We love him. And uh, it's a privilege to be with you um, this morning. Uh, as Pastor Alan Jessen have set the vision for our church this year, we are a church that is preparing the way for the Lord. And I like what Pastor Jessen uh, says about this. She, she says, it, we're not gonna say what the Lord is gonna do. We are just here to prepare the way that we're open to anything that Jesus wants to do in our church in 2024, which I think is a great status to have, a great posture to have, is that we're not in control of this. We're here for Jesus. We're here to see Him do His work. And so part of that, uh, as we prepare the way from, for the Lord, we feel that there's, it's really important for us to look at having hearts that are repentant and consecrated. So it should be a really fun morning in church this morning <laughs> as we talk through this. And I'm um, uh, so grateful, yes, uh, I've been in our church now for at least uh, 17 years. And um, so grateful uh, for this opportunity, but also for the people who have gone before me uh, and modelled consecration so, so well. Like if you look down, down the front row here, we've got Barry Maureen Southwell. Aren't these guys amazing? Give it up for them. We've got my dear friends here, Avenue and, and Marisi Kupu. Can we give it up for these guys? These guys are amazing. Uh, for, uh, we're in our Parramatta location for several years uh, and uh, here today, lovely to see you guys. Uh, Ava uh, w- uh, was running a youth ministry in, a, in Berwyn. I pr- it was one of my first ever preaching uh, opportunities about 16 years ago. So it's so great to see you, Avenua. Great to see the Coopers in the house as well. Give it up for the Coopers. Come on. Come on, we ought to honour these people for what they've done, for how they've set an example to us. And for Marion as well, we love you, Marion. Yeah, you guys are tired of clapping, fair enough. Okay, come on, give it up for Marion. And for me, that's, that's important when we, when, we, when, when we look at ourselves as a church, there are many people's example to follow uh, and that we don't, think we, we don't need to feel like we need to do it all on our own, that we are indeed a community following Jesus together. Uh, a little bit uh, about me as a preacher. Uh, and you would have known this actually, just seeing me in the pews, uh, in the seats in a, in a normal Sunday service. I like a noisy church. Uh, I like a bit of noise. I, I like it when, when, when the congregation is responding with the preacher, that it's not a performance, that we're in this together. But I will say this, I don't even care what noise it is. Like if you want to heckle, if you want to boo, if you, I, I don't mind because at least it means you're listening. So I'm more than happy for any kind of noise in the service. I'm more than happy for any kind of person to heckle. Just a footnote that your heckle will be heard by three people and I have the microphone. So just be careful with what you say because I have more of the power. All right, but what I really mean it though, I want you to go with me on this. I, I like a bit of noise in the service. I like, I like the sound of a church alive and listening, engaging with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And, and uh, I'm not doing my job well if you don't hear about Jesus dozens of times. That what we exist for, what this pulpit exists for, what we all are about is the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so I'm excited as we study and look at repentance and consecration today. I'm excited to help you go on this journey to grow deeper in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. There is nothing worth knowing more than the love, grace, goodness, and glory of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Oh, I'm glad I'm in church, people like Jesus. Okay, good. So let's, let's turn our eyes to, uh, we're gonna look at uh, Mark 1, and then we're gonna tie in a couple of scriptures, Hebrews 12 and Romans 12, 1 as well. Uh, so Mark 1, verses 1 through to 4. The beginning of the good news about Jesus the Messiah. Again, this is, all it's about, the good news about Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for Him. And so John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness 
of sins. Let's look at that last line again. A baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. So as we prepare the way for the Lord as a church, we're really gonna look at what it means to repent and to consecrate before the Lord. See this, Romans 12, 1. Therefore, since we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders us and the sin that so easily entangles, it easily entangles us. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, fixing our eyes on you, Jesus. You see, repentance to come before the Lord, to say sorry for our sin, to turn away from our sin, to receive forgiveness for our sin. It's only desirable if you wanna live for the Lord Jesus. What I mean by that is that no amount of religious pressure fitting in, a preacher telling you to repent, shame that you're feeling, none of it really matters. None of it's gonna seem feasible. Repentance is never going to be desirable. You're never going to want to repent unless you want to live for Jesus, to fix your eyes on Jesus. And I would go so far to say this, is that if you want forgiveness for your sin, but you don't want Jesus, then Christianity is not for you. If you want forgiveness for your sins, but you do not want Jesus, then Christianity is not for you because what it's all about is Jesus, His glory and His good news, fixing our eyes on Jesus. And so as we go on, in this, we see this in verse uh, one, we see this sin that so easily entangles. So here's some comfort, whilst it's also gonna be convicting. Sin is easy. Sin is easy and it's easy to get entangled. It's easy for us to sin. So maybe you felt like you've walked in this morning and you've seen some very bright, smiley church folk mostly good looking. I'm bringing down the average, but still most of us are good looking. Wait till you see me sweaty later. It's not gonna be a good sight, right? So most of us are good looking and we're happy and we're happy and we're singing praises and even our uh, our one and a half year olds are praising God. Like something's going on here, right? And and so you're looking at this place, man, and and you're matching up, you're comparing and going, geez, I I just don't fit in with these kind of people. I'm not that kind of person. Maybe you've never been in church. Maybe you're you're starting to explore Christianity and you're comparing yourself to people who have been on the journey going, oh boy, that's... I don't match up to that. I don't have my life together like that. I I got some good news for you, some comforting news that's gonna end up in convicting news, but here's some good news. Uh, It's easy, we're all sinners. It's easy for us all to sin and get entangled in our sinfulness. In fact, Romans 3.22 says it like this, for there is no distinction. There's no distinction. No matter how long you've been in church, no matter how long you've been raising your hands, no matter how long you've been giving, there is no distinction for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Sin is easy and it's easy to get entangled. So if you came in going, I'm not one of you, no, welcome to the club. There is no distinction. Sin is easy and we get entangled. Um, uh, I, I grew up in a house, I have four, uh, four boys, uh, three brothers. So prayers would be appreciated for my mother in continuing as looking after four, four sons, four wild and crazy Sons, the Farncombe boys, they knew us as. Just walking down the street, oh no, the Farncombe boys are here. No, they didn't, we were actually all quite scrawny, no one feared us, but um, uh, we were active and we were very, and, and so a, a hallmark of our childhood was whatever toy, instrument, tool that we were given, uh, it was never used for its intended purpose. Right? My mother would say with her mother's love, oh, my boys are so creative. Uh, everyone else said her boys are so destructive. Right? So, so, and that was just our customer. Whatever the tool was, whatever the game was, it was never used for its intended purpose. And so one day I'm out in the backyard. One day I'd love to afford a backyard, but that's a different story. So one day I'm out in my parents' backyard. And, uh, and so I'm in the backyard and I don't know what's happened, but my brothers are elsewhere. I don't know if they're in timeout and I'm not, which would be really crazy that I wasn't in timeout as well. Whatever was happening, my brothers went around and so I was quite bored and I was playing out in the backyard and we had one of those swing sets, you know, the ones with the green and you put it in and the yellow, it's like, a, it's a classic of all Australian backyards. And so, you know what a swing's for, you, you sit on it and swing, it's crazy. And, uh, and so then, and then, and then me and my brothers would obviously try and do the impossible, which is swing the swing over the top and try and defy gravity. Can't do it. 
can't do it, never been done, don't know, not, not, not in the income household, so we could never achieve that. So we gave up on that dream. But one day I'm out in the backyard and I'm looking for something fun to do. And so what I would do is I would put my, uh, my chest over the uh, swing seat and twist the chains up like this, right? Right? Twist, 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 and then whoosh, let it go, woo, like that, right? And get really dizzy, right? Kids just love getting dizzy. They're like, oh, I'm so drunk, man, right? Like they're just like getting, and so I would, I would just, get, and so obviously I would push the boundaries and push the boundaries and push the boundaries. So I'd get up and go as high, as high, as high, 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 high. So more tension there and then whoosh, get dizzier and dizzier and dizzier. And so then I've done that a few times. And so, and then I'm like, okay, I'm gonna go as high as I humanly possibly go as an eight-year-old. I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna, re-. so I twist, 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 twist. Twist. I think you know this is going. Twist. Until I've gone as high as I can. I'm literally on my tippy toes. I'm like up like this, right? Twisting. Were you impressed at how much I got on my tippy toes just then? Because I was. Okay, so I'm twisting. Twisting. And it gets to a point where I can't twist anymore. So I'm like, okay, the chains are actually stuck, which is great because I'm going to go really fast. Except the chains are stuck. I'm up on my tippy toes. I can't get leverage to, to twist off. And the seat is pressing against my throat. (laughs) And now this fun game, as I'm hanging myself, and I can still remember the feeling, I can still remember it getting fainter and like, (gasps) I'm actually gonna die, like (gasps) like this. And then out of nowhere, my mum sees me from the kitchen and comes rushing down. Good old mum, Sawney. Rescues me from the swing and bans me from ever using the swing ever again, right? (laughs) But what sin is like is like the eight-year-old me Twisting on the swing set. It starts easy. And before you know it, you keep twisting. You keep twisting. You keep twisting. And suddenly you're entangled. And you didn't mean to be the person that you are right now. You didn't mean to be living the life that you're living right now. You didn't mean to be in this place. You're like, how did I get here? Because it just kept twisting, twisting, which is why the scripture says it's easy and it entangles. And so what often happens when we get into this place, our heart hardens. We begin to avoid godly things like prayer, the Word, going to church, being in connect group and community, accountable to one, each, one another. We just keep twisting and twisting the shame, the darkness, the despair, the regret, the, the self-loathing just twists us further and further into a dark, isolated space. And maybe that is you right now. You do not like the version of yourself that you have become. You do not like how you followed this path of sinfulness and where you've ended up. And what's crazy about this, what what seems so paradoxical is that when we get ourselves entangled, and I speak from significant experience, when we get entangled in the sinfulness, what's so crazy about this is that as we have departed from a knowledge and appreciation of God's holiness and His righteousness, we also for some reason become more unfamiliar and distrusting in His grace and mercy. That we've moved away from His holiness, but it also means we don't really understand what His grace and mercy means because we aren't living from the holy standard anymore. And so we get into this place and now our heart is hardened because we're like, we can't go to God because I haven't got myself right. I've got to get myself right. I've got to untangle myself from this sinfulness, which is not the message of the gospel. So like, this is what God did like with John the Baptist, what we read in Mark 1, He sends John, He sends a call of repentance. Repentance is the catalyst moment for getting close to God again. Repentance is your catalyst moment for getting close to God again. Can you not see how then repentance, a call to repentance is a declaration of hope? That actually, hey, you're entangled, you're ashamed, you're isolated and you're suffering. And when Jesus calls out in the wilderness, when, 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 when His gospel comes into your wilderness and says, repent, it's not to condemn. It's a declaration and a cry of hope is there's a pathway forward for you. So if that's you I'm describing, I have some really, really good news about Jesus. See this in 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we confess to Him, He's faithful and just to forgive us 
and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So just as easy as it is to get entangled in the sinfulness, it's just as easy to find freedom, forgiveness and salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. That is the good news. That is the Gospel. You don't have to stay tangled. You don't have to choke out. You don't have to be separated from God any further. You can find Jesus and He can cleanse you from all unrighteousness. So the slate is wiped clean and you're a free person again. Come on, that's some good news. Give it up for Jesus. We thank you, Lord, for your gospel. You don't have to stay stuck. So if we've done this, if we've repented, if we've repented, so repentance is to turn away. We've turned away from our sin. We've gone, oh man, I need some mercy and forgiveness. And we've received this mercy and forgiveness. If we, if we By repenting, we turn away. Then to consecrate is to set apart ourselves or to give up. So repentance is the mercy part. Consecration is the worship part. So to return away, I turned away. That, that's not where the gospel story ends. That's where it starts. See this, let's see this in uh, Romans 12, 1. Paul writes this, Therefore I urge you, this ain't optional. This is important. I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy... We start with the gospel, we start with His forgiveness, we start with His grace in view of God's mercy to offer yourselves, offer your bodies, gets culty here, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. For this, this is your true and proper worship to consecrate to Jesus. Say that again, in view of God's mercy. So Paul's actually saying, in view of it, in light of it, because of it, because you've repented and received forgiveness, in view of God's mercy now. And so what we understand about God's grace, mercy and forgiveness is they are not the ceiling over our life, but the springboard to launch from, to fulfil the purpose and plan of God that He has for our life. It is not a ceiling, it's a springboard. And it's also a crash mat. So when you're out there going and you fall into that sin that's so easily entangles, you can get back up again. You don't have to do all the work again. That work was done on the cross when He resurrected from the grave. As Tim Keller puts it, it's a receipt, proof of payment. You don't have to work out your salvation. You don't have to work out your righteousness before God. It's been worked out through the sacrifice and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So in view of God's mercy, then we go. So here we go. So then Paul says, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. And I just need to make a note here. Maybe you're new, maybe you're a friend, maybe you've brought a friend to this the first time in church and you're like, hey, come and check out the C3 thing. Uh, I just wanna make it abundantly clear that this is not a cult. I just wanna get that out there. I should have said at the start, I'm sorry, but it's not a cult. So when we read this, when when we read what Paul says, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, he is not saying die. He's not saying ever, because also the church wouldn't grow if everyone just died every time they were like, okay, I'll consecrate, right? It's just bad strategy, firstly and foremost. Secondly, we're not a cult, right? What Paul's doing is he's trying to find the most dramatic, hyperbolic, most extreme way of explaining what it means. He's trying to say, have total dedication to Jesus. In view of what you got, in view of His total dedication to you, where He gave His life for you, in view of His mercy, live in total dedication to Jesus Christ. The key part here is to be a living sacrifice. In the Old Testament times, they would have understood it as there was a one-time sacrifice to pay for our sins. But Paul would say, no, it's more than that. We're a living one. The one-time sacrifice has occurred. Christ has paid for our sins. Now we're a living one. Now we're ones who consecrate and live in worship to Him. Another way to describe this is consecration, to be a living sacrifice. And so Paul is saying this when he says, in the view of the mercies now, in view of the mercy of God now, offer yourself as a living sacrifice. He's saying this, now that you have the rewards of the gospel, you must also choose the costs of it. That if you want the rewards, the joy, the glory, the perfect love, the forgiveness, the freedom, now that you have the rewards of the gospel, you also need to choose the costs of the gospel, the costs of living for Jesus, for true and proper worship to consecrate your lives for Him. And so the question uh, uh, is required of us to ask ourselves, to ask yourself, what do you need to consecrate? As we prepare the way for the Lord this year, what do you need to give up? What do you need to lay down? What is your true and proper worship? Um, Many of you would know this story as I've been here a long time, but um, 
Uh, I, I know a story for me about really where I feel like consecration was truly defined for me is um, when I chose to go into ministry. Uh, I don't come from a Christian family. Um, I was, became a Christian at 14 or 15. Um, I, don't, I, I say 14, 15 because I don't care about details, but it's around that age. And um, I, I don't just come from a non-Christian family. I don't come from an atheist family. I come from an anti-theist family. So like my dad, uh, it wasn't like, he wasn't just atheist. It wasn't like, oh, I don't like believing in, I don't believe in God. It was like, I don't like people who believe in God. I don't like the system. I think it's all a, 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 a scandal, a debacle. I hate it all. And so I grew up in that. Oh, it's pretty joyful. And, um, and, uh, and, 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 I, and for me, I was following my father's footsteps. I was quite, uh, uh, I used to mock Christianity. I used to, I used to think I was so clever. I was like, oh, what's, what's the big deal about two pieces of wood and a guy dying on it? Why are the Christians all about that, right? It's called the gospel idiot. Anyway, so, um, so I, I was like that. And then um, uh, for some reason, my dad sent me to Oxford Falls Grammar. <laughs> which is a puzzling decision because he hates God, but he sent me to the Christian school. And there was like a youth, I, I really don't know. I, I, he's sometimes short-sighted. Anyway, so um, not just physically. So um, he uh, sent me to the school and there was a, a revival sweeping up the Northern Beaches and I got saved. I got genuinely, truly saved. I was like, I was trying to be this tough kid like my dad and I didn't have any emotion. I just remember weeping for days as I encountered the love and truth and the good news of Jesus Christ. I was truly saved. Yeah, I had my repentance moment. Yeah. Well, oh, thank you for your support. It's so lovely. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, thank you. I had my come to Jesus moment. I had received the, the forgiveness of my sins. I had, I had come into knowledge, into relationship with the true and perfect one, Jesus Christ. My life was changed. In view of God's mercy, my life was changed. But then there was a cost call to. Uh, the cost was required. I got the rewards and now there was a call. And uh, not long after I had gotten saved, I really felt like my calling was to be in ministry, was to be a preacher. And you can imagine how well that went in an anti-theist family. And uh, my dad was, he's a good man. He was just very misguided. And um, he, so he would, he would do things like, if I got grounded, uh, I could go anywhere. Like my grounding was, you just can't go to church. Um, and dad would say things like, uh, you know, ultimately, because I think he was seeing I was really getting into it. I think it was a father who thought his son was going down the wrong track. So he was like really trying to get me out. And uh, he said, he could really see I was in. And uh, he said, mate, I'd honestly rather you go to parties and do drugs and, have, and drink than go to the church. Like he really was worried about this place because the living sacrifice thing, I guess. Anyway, so, um, and, and, and so he was like really anti it. And so, but I, I, I didn't, you know, I wanted to honour my mother and father. So I was in a really tough place and it just created this great divide in us, especially when I said, okay, so, hey, dad, uh, after school, um, I know you've got plans for me to go to uni, um, uh, I actually want to go to Bible college. I want to do the internship. I want to be a preacher and I'm going to do it. Um, and so he said, okay, here's what we'll do. Um, you can go if you study hard in year 12 because I hadn't been studying at all before that. And uh, so he's like, if you study hard in year 12 and you get to the uni course, you can go to college and then go to uni. I'm like, okay, man, man, God's grace is so good. I've just worked out that I'm the master negotiator. I've worked out that I can pursue the call of God and keep my dad happy. Yeah, baby, right? So, so I, I, I work hard. Now, granted, I probably wouldn't have had to work hard if I'd done any work the previous 16 years of school, but it doesn't matter. <laughs> I worked hard. I was studying 35 hours a week. I was getting up early in the morning, late at night. I was studying. I was working. And, and partly because I had to catch up in maths because I took a while to discover Harry Potter. And so I was reading Harry Potter in maths. And so I really needed to learn a lot about maths. Sorry. Harry Potter's a good book, by the way. Anyway, so I... <laughs> I, so I was catching up on that. And anyway, I worked really, really hard and I got in, got in. I got the ATAR, I got the mark, I got into the uni course that my dad wanted me to go to. So I come back to it and I'm just feeling like, man, I've done it. God's good. And uh, I, I go to him and say, dad, so I've got into the course. So we're, I'm gonna do the Bible college thing and then we'll do maybe, maybe do the uni thing and, um, <laughs> and maybe do your plan. And, uh, and knowing full well by then, God would really have taken me. Um, and he said, oh, I just lied about that, mate, to make you study. And, uh, and he says, oh, we really can't support this decision. And you, if you're going to do it, we're going to kick you out of home. And, um, and so for me, I already knew that he said he had a month, but I already knew what the decision was. I'm choosing Jesus. <laughs> and so I just remember that month weeping, wailing every night by myself in my room. Because what, and I reflect on this later, I didn't know at the time, I just was in this kind of, my faith had always been under attack. So I was always in siege mentality. I wasn't quite thinking through the emotions of it. Also I was 17, so give me a break. So then later in reflection, I realised what the greatest pain was that I had lost my father's approval. 
I'd lost it. And uh, that's what I had to give up. That was the cost for me to follow Jesus. And I wanna say, I wanna say that, uh, and I rushed straight into the perfect Father's love and had His approval and affirmation. But I must admit, I'm still on that journey. And so I wanna make that point clear with consecration is that we, it, it's not about getting. Now there's some great parts of the story. My mum became a Christian. She's just joined staff at a church in Newcastle looking after the homeless community. Like, there's some amazing things that have happened in my family. Some amazing God glorifying things, yeah. But that, that is not why we consecrate. Uh, we do not consecrate to get. We consecrate because we know what we've already been given through the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so... And so I think this is important to note is that with Christianity, if you're considering Jesus, if you're considering the Christian faith, Christianity is about receiving the greatest prize. It is not about getting every prize. That there will be opportunities that you will miss. There will be things that are not even sinful, things that you just delight in that you will have to lay down as God purifies you and prepares you for what He wants to do in your life. Consecration costs us, but it's worth doing. Why? Because in view of God's mercy, in view of His mercy. Do you know what you were saved from? Do you know the condemnation that was owed to you? But in view, of his, in view of His mercy, He died for you. He died for us. He resurrected. He saved you. In view of that mercy, I'll give everything. In view of that mercy, we'll do anything. As we, as we, um, and so the question becomes, what will you give up? As a church, we're asking ourselves this question, what will we give up for Him? What will we set aside? What will we consecrate? What will I consecrate before the Lord so that He can do His work in our church this year? He, he can do His work in your life this year. And um, uh, just wanna consider maybe as we've been discussing, and I'll invite the band to come on up, as we've been exploring sinfulness, as we've been exploring consecration, we're, we're talking about acts, acts we've done that we regret and acts that we haven't done that we know we should. And so it can help us, to, it, it, it can cause us to reflect on our behaviour and it can cause us to feel guilty or, or, or in regret or are ashamed. And, and that, that same, we enter into that same cycle I talked about where we're just further and further and further away from the Lord. Uh, Matt Chandler uh, uh, of Acts 29 tells this great story. He says he was reaching out to a, a, a friend of his in college who um, was making some really bad decisions. He and his mates, there was this young woman, um, she was sex, sexually promiscuous, she had, had a lot of partners, there was a lot of family situations, she was in some uh, domestic violence relationships, it was all a mess. She was, making, she was having a really, really tough time. And so they were witnessing to her just the grace and mercy of the Gospel saying, hey, there's a better way, there's a Jesus way, He loves you. When you repent, repentance isn't to destroy you, it's a cause for hope. And he's reaching out to her. And so what, 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 there's, a, there's a Christian music festival going on down the road. Thousands of people are gonna turn up. And so he invites her along to it. And he says, he says so I invited her along to it, but I, I knew what was going on. I said, come and check out this music. <laughs> but he knew, full well knew that at the end of the music, there was gonna be a message, a gospel invitation for his friend. And so uh, they go there, the, the music's great, you know, yay. And, uh, and then there's thousands of people there and then a preacher gets up. And Charles says, it was the worst the worst, the most horrific handling of sexual purity that he'd ever heard. Like the preacher was saying disgusting things like, you don't want syphilis, do you? Or he's like, it's all fun and games until you get herpes on your lip. Like just disgusting, just repulsive, throwing judgment after judgment, condemnation after condemnation, fear and shame. And halfway through the message, he says, and here's this rose, and he's got this perfect, pristine rose. It looks just beautiful and perfect. And he throws it out into the crowd. And he says, I want everyone to touch it. I want everyone to pass it around. I'll ask for it at the, back, at the, at the end of the sermon. And so he goes on and continues to uh, uh, turn or burn, bring condemnation, bring all this shame upon these people. And, and Chandler's head with his, this friend, this person who's desperate for the gospel. And she's just getting perched further and further away. And as he goes to c conclude, his big crescendo, his climax, his major point, he says, so where is my rose? Bring me back this rose. And as you would expect, a rose that's gone through a thousand sweaty hands in a concert, comes back, all the petals are gone. This perfect pristine rose, gone. It's banged up, it's broken, it's hanging on by a thread, it's dirty, it's grimy. There's nothing that resembles the rose, the purity of what it once was. And he thinks he's so clever and he says, he holds up the rose and you see, see this rose? Who would want this? Who would want this broken rose? 
Chandler says he's like so angry. He wants to wring the neck of the preacher. He wants to get up and yell, stop the show, stop the message. Because when you ask who wants this rose, he wants to yell out, Jesus wants the rose. That's the whole point of the Gospel, that He became our sin so that we may become the righteousness of God. That is the good news of Jesus. That if you are feeling like the broken rose, if you are feeling separated, distracted, rejected and condemned, there is one and there is only one. The true one, the perfect one, the glorious one. He is God, He's Jesus Christ and He died for you. Jesus wants the rose. Jesus wants you for all your sins, for all your dysfunction, your inadequacies, your insecurities, your greatest shames and your greatest regrets. Jesus wants you. And so if you feel like I'm that broken rose, I've been trying to work out my life myself. I wanna ask you, aren't you exhausted? Isn't this tiring, trying to justify your own existence, trying to save yourself? Don't you know there's hope on the other side of repentance? Don't you know there's mercy on the other side of saying yes to Jesus? He wants the rose, He wants you. And so in this moment, if I can ask everyone to close their eyes and bow their heads, because we're gonna say a prayer. We're gonna say a prayer to Jesus. We're gonna invite Jesus. We're gonna invite the Gospel into our hearts. And so we close our eyes because we protect the privacy and sincerity of this moment because I'm talking to some specific people right now. You know I'm the broken rose and I need a Saviour. I'm the broken rose and I need grace and forgiveness. So what I wanna do is include you in a prayer. I'm not gonna make it embarrass you. I'm not gonna make a big production of it. I just wanna know who I'm praying with as we invite Jesus into our heart. So if that's you and you know I'm the broken rose and I need salvation, right now, raise your hand for me. You know that's you. You know you need Jesus. Awesome, awesome. Couple of hands so far. Who else is there? Say yes to Jesus. Amazing, amazing. Love it. Thank you, sir. Who else is there? Raise your hand. Don't miss out on Jesus. You've been too long twisted. You've been too long entangled. Jesus is here for you right now. Raise your hand. Say, I want Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Amazing. Why don't we in this moment, let's stand. Let's keep our eyes on Jesus. It's still a moment of worship, We're not getting distracted. We're respecting the sincerity and the sacredness of this moment. We thank You, Jesus, Holy Spirit. You're here. We thank You, Jesus, for Your Gospel. For those who have responded, so let's pray this prayer. Repeat after me this one. Dear Father, I thank You for the gift of salvation. I acknowledge I'm a sinner in need of salvation and I repent of my sin. I thank You for the cross where Jesus took my shame and I accept You, Jesus, as my Lord and Saviour. So Holy Spirit, fill me with Your grace and Your strength to live Your ways and do Your will all the days of my life. In Jesus' mighty Name, everyone said Amen. Amen. Come on, praise Jesus this morning for His Gospel, for His good news. And for those those, uh, few brave people who said yes to Jesus. And in this moment, let's reflect again. Because it wasn't just a word for the one who doesn't know Jesus. It It was a word for all of us. What is God calling you to consecrate? What is God asking you to lay down? Spend a moment here reflecting. Holy Spirit, would you speak? You do the work, Holy Spirit. As you look to Jesus, what is He saying? What is the call? What is the cost? It might not even be a sinful thing. It might be just something He wants to grow you in through sacrifice. What is the cost, Lord? Speak to us. Right now, let's all just reflect. Let the Holy Spirit speak. Thanks so much for joining us today. If you want to know more about Jesus, about our church, 
or if you're in Sydney and would like to plan a visit, head to our website, c3syd.church and find a C3SYD location near you. You can also follow us on Instagram at c3.syd. Subscribe to our messages on YouTube and listen to our podcast too. See you soon.